the last memory I have of that is walking into the room. I heard a scuffle. And I walked in and I can still see the the shine of the blade. He had a butcher's knife around her throat. Because his theory was that if I can't have you, no one can. So he might as well kill us. If you've ever been told you weren't good enough, not big enough, not fast enough, not smart enough, or if you've ever felt paralyzed by a failure you just weren't willing to accept, this is the show for you. Hustle and Motivate is a blueprint built by guests who've conquered obstacles, silenced critics, and overcome adversity by seeing every failure as an opportunity, realizing the true power of the underdog mentality. This is Tyler O'Shea, and you're listening to Hustle and Motivate. Today's guest was homeless at 15 years old, fought in the war in Afghanistan, and played in the 2015 Gridiron World Cup in Canton, Ohio. In 2018, he was named Young Australian of the Year for his work with at-risk youth, and today, he's helping small businesses grow and leave a lasting legacy. Yeah, you're probably wondering how this all happened, so we'll get right into it. Here is Zach Breyers. So, Zach, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so uh, my name is Zach Bryars, and currently I run my own business doing uh, small business strategy and looking at ideas and techniques to grow uh, small businesses. And, you know, on the side to that, I also do professional speaking and am a parent full-time with three kids and a bunch of of other things, pretty much whatever I can do to get by. (laughs) Awesome. And so you have a pretty amazing story behind how you got to where you are today. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about. But do you want to start by taking taking me back to what you were like growing up? You know, gr- growing up, it was um, it was challenging. But, you know, looking back on it, I've always found it beneficial. The um, Pretty much from day one, my, my father left. He left pretty much the day I was born. And it was, it was me and my mom growing up, just the two of us by ourselves trying to survive. And my mom wouldn't tell, she would tell me later that a lot of the things that we went through uh, related back to her initial upbringing. So she was raised in an extremely violent household, domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse. And a lot of the time, you know, she later told me that she never really knew what love was. So, so this led on to her making some bad decisions in terms of, you know, relationships that she thought were healthy but were, in in fact, extremely detrimental to us. And everyone around her had always told her, you know, get that boy a father. And so she did what she could and, you know, tried to find a father to help raise me. And, you know, a lot of those guys ended up becoming (laughs) quite uh, despicable people. You know, we, we were living in this town. I grew up in New Zealand in a small country town and you know looking back at it it was kind of kind of feels like the set to a horror movie you know it's just below the snow line there's probably two shops there real real big drug problem real big violence pro- problem not many police around and she she was dating this guy called Mark and you know he seemed nice he was he was cool I was, you know I was four or five by this time and she was walking, they were driving through the snow one day and she saw this girl with a newborn walking through the snow and she said, oh, that's, that's Tina. What, what's, what's she doing walking out there? And he said, oh, you know, <laughs> she probably didn't cook her husband's potatoes right, you know, kicked her out, t- told her what for. And it was that my mum had been growing tired of this town for years and she just turned, turned to him and said, you know what, you're the problem with this town is that everyone sees all these things going on and no one does anything about it. So just get out of my car. Left him in the snow, drove off. And, you know, later that night, she dropped me in my grandma's and said, you know, I'll be back. i got to deal with some stuff. And she went into the pub, walked in, and um, saw Mark having a beer with, his, um, with this girl's husband. And she said, okay, all right. She walked back out to the car and, she grabbed an axe and walked back into the pub, slammed it down on the table in front of this guy and said, you know what, you want to pick on a woman, you can pick on a woman who can fight. And 
you know, she was Auckland, she was Auckland kickboxing champ in 1985. So she, wow. she, she kind of showed him what, what she meant by that, you know, but it, it was a series of those kind of events. You know, we went from to the next town we had to leave and, um, she met this guy who she thought was a real nice guy and he appeared to be and, you know, but it wasn't working out. So she said, you know, I think it's not working out. And the last memory I have of that is walking in to the room. I heard a scuffle and I walked in and I can still see the, the shine of the blade. He had a butcher's knife around her throat because his theory was that if I can't have you, no one can. So he might as well kill us. So I walked in and I must have distracted him just a little bit. So she managed to get free, kicked the knife under the bed, grabbed me, grabbed the car keys, and we just left, left all our stuff, all our belongings, and just left town. And, you know, it was for about six months, you know, we kind of go from town to town, living with some family members. And eventually it got too much that my mom had to go in hiding away from me. So she went went to live with some people in, in the deep south and, you know, I stayed with my uncle and, you know, but it became clear after a while that he was kind of after me because he would start showing up in this town. And I can still remember, you know, walking down the street and I looked across the road and he was just staring straight back at me and didn't blink, didn't move. And it was, it was at that time that everyone kind of made the decision, you know, you guys need to leave the country. So I got shipped off to Australia and, um, you know, lived with some other family over there. And my mum came about six months later. And that was the last we heard from that guy. But, you know, kind of, it was, it was the same issues with my mum. She just never, had never known what love was and never really loved herself. You know, we ended up finding this guy who I called dad once or twice. And they got a house together. They both worked in the movie industry. First time we'd have had a house, first time we'd really been stable. But he was working late a lot. You know, he was kind of, you know, doing some long hours. And, you know, no one thought anything of it until the bills started coming in, the mortgage wasn't getting paid. And it came out that he was actually just spending all our money on cocaine. He had a, he had a crack addiction. So he came home one night and um, she confronted him and, you know, he started shoving her out the house saying, you're nothing, who would want you, you know, you're worthless. And she said, don't shove me out of the house with my, with my son there. And he kept going and, you know, later she she woke me up said, let's go. We got to go. I didn't ask a question, just grab my stuff and we jumped in the car. But as I was leaving, <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed this guy, Rob, was his name. He was uh, wedged underneath one of the couches. Um, she flipped it over and shoved him in there. And his cheeks and face was all bloody. So she had ha- had to really defend herself there and, you know, got a way out and he was crying and we made a move. And a couple of hours later, you know, I'd seen her just crying and said, you know, where are we going? She said, I don't know. So I, I kind of got the hint then. I was about, I was about nine at this point and um, pulled up in a McDonald's car park and went to sleep. You know, my mum. She slept with her head on the window and I laid down in the back, got up next day, went to school. And, uh, you know, we did that for about two or three weeks until we found a place. And, you know, one of the things I can remember from that time is that my mom, I'd always, I would always see, she'd never make a sound, she'd never make a whimper, but from the reflection of the McDonald's sign, I could still see the tears streaming down her face as she stared straight ahead. And she never, she never once complained to me or ever said how much she was hurting. But I always remember seeing that. And, you know, one night she woke me up and she said, look, don't ever let where we are now determine where you end up. Even those with nothing can have the greatest impact based on how they conduct themselves every day. You know, and that, that was one of those things that really stuck with, stuck with me over, over the course of my life. And, you know, we kept going. We kept going. We found, found a place and things happened. We started to get together, but... At this point, I'd become real angry. I, you know, over these experiences, I'd started to really take it out on anyone around me, teachers, my mom especially, so-called friends, and become real angry and real disruptive. And so, you know, I started failing at school and started just taking the easy way out. So 
you know, it came to, I was really influenced by the people I thought were my friends and they'd always joked that I was a, I was a drifter. I was never going to be anything. I was never going to amount to anything. And at the time I didn't really know what that meant, what they were trying to get out of. I just thought it was funny. I'd laugh. Yeah, probably, you know, you know, buy into it. You know, and th- then eventually I dropped out of school because of the encouragement of these guys, because we're all going to do it. Let's all just drop out of school and, you know, we'll go work. And I ended up being the only one who did. So, you know, I got myself in a real bad place at that point. And what my mom had been doing, she'd been working for a place that ended up going bankrupt. So, you know, we lost the place we were living and, you know, no work, no job, no money. It started to become real, real tough for us to get a place. And, you know, about the time I was 15, it was hard based on my aggression and the things, the bad criminal things I was doing for flatmates to want to have this kid in their house. Mm-hmm. You know, so in my eyes, I was like, you know what, mom, we need to split because I want you to have a house. I'm good. I'll be fine. I, ne- I never told her what my plan was, but I just wanted her to, you know, you go look after you, get a place, I'll figure it out. And, you know, we did that. We did that. And throughout that time, I was probably homeless for about two years living on the street for a lot of it. And me and my mum the other night actually just went through that two years and kind of went through what had happened. And a lot of it we kind of forgotten about, you know, the places that my mom was living in. And, you know, I'd come there just to sleep for a night and, you know, then I have to go because of the people around there. She was living in some real bad places, trying to deal with that. And then as time went on, then trying to deal with the depression and everything that sinks in when you're in that kind of situation. So, you know, went from there to, I'd always, I'd always thought I was going to amount to nothing, amount to, you know, not being anything and pretty much being what people told me I was going to be. But I'd always really wanted to join the army. And I, I eventually found a place with, with some with some people who were about 10 years older than me. So they were a bit more mature than the people I was hanging out with. And, you know, they were the first people outside my mum that I'd actually really known that had jobs and had worked consistently. So they kind of showed me a whole new way to live compared to the other people I was hanging out with who were dealing drugs and doing doing all the bad stuff that's never going to be productive in your life. So I ended up moving in with them and started kind of getting my life together, starting to get getting on Centrelink or welfare. You know, met my partner at the time and, you know, made a decision to join the army. So joined the army and um, my, my whole thing there was no one ever thought I could do it. Everyone, even the people I lived with who were good people, just never thought I could make it through the army. And my whole life, I'd really been given in to what people said I couldn't do and kind of saying, you know what, I think you're right. But it it was this one time where I thought, well, I've been doing that. How about I try this other path of doing the opposite of what people think I can do? And they they just couldn't see how this kid who had no job and had no goals in life could make it through basic training do all this hard stuff and yeah so you know i signed up joined and hated every single minute of basic training hated every single minute you know we had half our platoon quit in the first four weeks i think it was and i wanted to quit every day but i i kept picturing myself going back and telling these people that they were right and that's what kind of kept me going and then the day, days went on, days went on, and then I finished basic training and then started my, my employment training, you know, and eventually made it through. And by that point, I'd built so much in my self-esteem that I'd never really had before that, you know, I kind of felt like, hey, you know, I'm a soldier now. Like, people thought I was going to be nothing and I'm doing something that, by percentage, not many people are actually successful at. So, you know, I went through there. Me and my partner were still together and started moving in together and getting real stable. So I, I drove my unit. I was a cavalry soldier, so I drove armored vehicles and, you know, went there, went to my unit and got deployed to Afghanistan. So I deployed to Afghanistan in June 20, 2011 and went over there as a lead call sign. So my whole role was to, you know, clear the way for the rest of the call sign, find IEDs, find ways through ambushes and so on and so forth. We lived in a real tiny patrol base in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan. So there's probably 
20 of us all up. And it was just us for the whole time we were there. And it was kind of the first time I'd really had people where my whole goal was just not to be the weakest link on that day. I always thought I was the weakest link in, in the morning and my, the rest of my day was proven to myself and everyone else that I wasn't. So, you know, that kind of it keeps you going, keeps you motivated, even when it's really hard and really tired and you're dealing with scorpions and no showers, no toilets, everything like that. So you had this purpose. And it was the first time in my life I really had that purpose. You know, I'm a soldier. I'm fighting in a war. And, you know, of course, there's things that suck. But, you know, philosophically, you know, this is what's motivating. And then, you know, we were, um, we were out on combat operations around the Hellman border. And I started getting these just excruciating headaches that, you know, I, I've had them since. And I, I've put my head through a wall that were that painful. It just feels like a drill going in and out. And, you know, a fun fact is the, the star of Harry Potter, um, I forget his name right now, he actually suffers from these as well. So they're called cluster headaches where the brain releases histamine for no apparent reason, just the pain chemical for no apparent reason. And so it felt like a drill going in and out of your head for about four hours, and it happened about four times a day, all through all through the night. And the you know none of the painkillers worked. Panadol didn't do anything. And I was on a lead. I was a lead call sign, so I have to drive. You know, everyone everyone's hurt. You know, we're in the desert. And so I was driving about sixteen hours a day. We were on combat operations, and you know, getting into contacts and you know so forth. And you know, driving about 16 hours a day and getting these throughout the day and then getting them throughout the night. So it was about after, after about six weeks, my platoon commander said, you know what, like, there's no way we can have you out here like this. You haven't slept in about four weeks and we're going to have to send you back just to the, just to the main base, just to get some medical treatment, get this figured out. I said, yep, that's fine. Let's get it figured out. Cause I was in severe pain and, um, Got back, didn't say goodbyes to any of my guys because I was going to be back in a couple of days. They were just going to figure it out. You know, and I got back to the main base and they um, they said, you know, we we don't have the equipment to figure out what's going on. At the time, they didn't know what cluster headaches were. They said, we're going to have to send you home. And I, I, was, I was really excited because I was, at that point, I was so sick of living in the desert, the scorpions and all that. I miss my family. I'd, ha- I'd had a baby girl just before I left and I wanted to go see her. I was excited. And so I skipped back to my accommodation and um, a couple of days went by. I was real quick. I was excited. I can't wait to go home. And then I got on the plane to leave and I gave the finger to Afghanistan. I was like, I'm never coming back here. I'm so sick of it. And I uh, got on the plane and there's a guy missing two legs. He'd been blown up. Another guy had five bullet wounds. You know, everyone was in these unbelievable medical conditions. And I'm there with headaches. And I got on the plane and just thought, man, you're just the biggest coward that I can even possibly imagine. So all the self-esteem I built up just died on that day. And I looked out the window as I left Afghanistan and just, thought to myself, this is going to be a defining moment in your life because you've made this decision. You should have fought harder to stay. You know, all your guys are staying there, staying back in the desert and doing what they got to do. And you know, I got home. I was real angry. I was real, real angry. I didn't know what at. I was just angry at everyone. I was eventually diagnosed with PTSD and, uh, you know, made some bad decisions throughout the last part of my time in the Army just because of my anger. And, um, you know, as I was leaving the army, I really bought into what I thought the world was telling me, which was that I was nothing. I'd gone back to when I was a teenager Hmm. and, you know, people, people probably weren't giving me that, but, you know, confirmation bias in the brain meant that that's what I believed. And that was the information I was going to seek out. So nothing was going well. I wasn't participating at home. Like I was barely putting the milk away. I was on medical leave. So I was staying home all day playing Xbox. And my missus is working full time. She's taking my daughter to daycare. So we're we're struggling as a family as well. And at some point that I really had to sit there and I ended up having this honest conversation. And, And to me, that's the hardest part of 
getting change in your life is having that real honest conversation that's not to speak down about your flaws but to identify them. I just said to myself, I'm not happy with the way my life has turned out right now. I cannot change the fact that I was a coward, but I can change how I'm participating in my life. And I made a decision that I didn't want to be lazy anymore. I didn't want to be unmotivated. I had no horizon because my whole thinking at that time was I was a soldier. I was in Afghanistan. And now that wasn't going to happen. I was getting medically discharged. The whole image of my life was done. So I had to sit down and create a new image of what I wanted to be. And through identifying the fact I didn't want to be lazy anymore, I thought, you know what, I've, I've never played football, you know, American football. And you know, they don't really play it much in Australia. I thought, you know, well, why not? I've always watched the NFL. I love the Ravens and stuff like that. And I thought, you know what, why not do it? I've got nothing else going on. So I said, well, you know, why don't we try and make the Australian team in 18 months? Because, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, if I set a goal low, that's easy to accomplish. I'm not learning anything out of it. I want it to be hard. I want it to have a time limit because my thinking was if I don't make the Australian team, I'm going to get better at a sport I've never done. I'm going to make more friends. I'm going to be, I'm going to have a goal every day. Mm-hmm. So every day I woke up, figured out how I was going to learn, you know, started playing football, started training twice a day. And anytime my PTSD and mental health got real bad, having that goal of no, 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 you got to put this on the back burner because you have a goal to, goal to achieve really got me motivated and started moving forward. And I eventually made the Australian team in 17 months and played in the 2015 World Cup. And I was the worst player on the team. I was, I was not good at all. Um, but my, my goal wasn't to be the best. My goal was to make the team. And, and I ended up doing it. But, you know, of course, when I was at the World Cup, I wanted to be the best player. But when I came back, I had to really reevaluate what that goal was and what I learned out of it. And did you did you share that goal when you when you set out to do that? Did you share that goal with anyone? Yeah. So you know, while I was on that journey, I started my my career. I wanted to achieve was to work with kids who grew up like me, and just kind of pass on the lessons I'd learned. So I started working with gangs and at risk youth and homeless youth and drug addicted youth, and doing that it was aiming to help them make positive decisions to link them into positive pathways for behavior change so you know identifying the kids that were most at risk and how what we would then do is go you know what's your dream job and we would just work with them on getting towards that goal achieving the goal and as they build confidence they start to develop a new identity for themselves so having that it keeps you motivated on that goal, my goal of playing in the World Cup. That really kept me accountable. You know, I, I was lucky I, I made it, you know, but I always said to the kids I work with that I was only not going to make the team if I stopped trying. That, you know, maybe I have 1% to make, make the Australian team, to make the national team while I'm trying, but I have 0% if I don't. So why not take those odds? And, um, you know, I, I was lucky to make it. and had a great time but i gotta be honest the thing i miss most about playing football you know i stopped playing football right after the world cup wasn't playing in the world cup wasn't playing in canton or anything like that but it was preparing for it i missed the purpose of waking up every day and you know so i came back it was a couple months of downtime and you know started working on my next goal and you know what would the people I worked with what would help them out and what would you know create a change there so I started um I started applying for a Churchill Fellowship so Churchill Fellowship is established by Winston Churchill to develop ideas outside of Australia to go find these ideas and bring them back to Australia to create a positive change within the community so I looked at cure violence which is uh you know has an amazing success rate in Chicago, Baltimore, New York, and South Bronx and Brooklyn. And in terms of, you know, violence reduction and at-risk communities. So I put together this fellowship and was lucky enough to get selected and, you know, went and, you know, lived in 
Chicago, you know, around Cicero and around the South Sides and stuff like that, and in West Baltimore and you know South Bronx, New York, and then eventually in Rio de Janeiro and the favelas in the South Side. And um, my whole goal with that was to identify how this amazing program was getting these results in at-risk communities by simply having role models within an at-risk community, creating role models that can enable behavior change. And, you know, I kept saying to the people I was, I was working with, I was like, if you knew how I grew up, me being here right now is, is surreal for me because I thought I was the only one growing up like this. And, you know, and I'd tell them my story. And they, you know, it was kind of this shared connection of it's not an isolation. It's, you know, th- there's a bigger context to this. You know, so I came home and, you know, ha- had a number of hairy experiences throughout my time on that trip and um, came home. And, you know, eventually, because I'd, I'd really reached the pinnacle of what I could do within working with at-risk youth and community and stuff like that, I really thought, okay, I've done enough there. I want to really challenge myself outside of that. And at the time, my daughter had just gone through brain cancer. So she has a brain tumor and she had just gone through, this is my second daughter, she would just gone through nine brain surgeries just before the trip and was, you know, there was a lot of follow-up when I came back. So I, I kind of thought, you know what, I want to start to be able to provide for my family more because you know, a lot of those community service jobs don't pay enough. They're great, great karma that make you feel good. You do, you have a big impact, but it's really hard to survive in an expensive economy on on those kind of wages. And you know, I thought, you know, I've I've always I've never been, you know, middle income. I've always been lower class and. I want my daughters to be at that level. So I started trying to uh, get a corporate job, started trying to become a consultant, you know, something entry level or anything like that. And, um, you know, at the time, I just won Young Australian of the Year for my work with at Youth and just my story in general. I'm not quite sure what won that award, but, you know, I just tried, tried to live my life and the community seemed to appreciate that. So I, I thought, you know, I'm I'm a good I'm a good addition to a corporation. And in the six months after that award, I probably had about 274 job rejections. Okay. Got one interview throughout the time. Didn't even make, didn't even get the job after that interview. And I kind of went in that same space that I went when I came back from Afghanistan. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, no one, no one will give me a job. I can't get a job. You know, I eventually sat down and had an honest conversation and thought to myself, well, why wouldn't I give myself a job? What do I think is the reason I'm not getting this? And it came down to the fact that I figured out and I believe in my head, because I wasn't qualified, I had no skin in the game and I couldn't prove that I really wanted this particular job, say in business. I I had no training in that. I could adapt to that but I couldn't prove it. And, you know, there's a lot of company rhetoric about we hire over, we hire experience over qualifications. But what they don't tell you is you've got to have the qualification first, then they prioritize the experience. So me not having the qualification, but a ton of experience set me back. And I thought to myself, why would I choose to be on the back foot? So I thought to myself, you know, I, I dropped out of high school. You know, I thought, well, could do a degree and I thought well why not do a master's you know the worst that can happen in a master's is that I don't finish it but at least I'm going to learn more so I signed up to do an MBA and just you know thought yeah, let's figure it out let's challenge myself I, I wasn't going to sell myself short in terms of qualifications I could do I was going to aim aim for the top and I figured an MBA I'd never be underqualified for anything in terms of business so I started doing that and, you know, eventually just started my own business doing business strategy and, you know, really found that there, there's a there's a way of thinking about assets and incentives and investment that a lot of small businesses struggle to find because they're so weighed down with the work, the work that you've got to produce. It's very hard to think on a macro level. And that may, led me to this point where I'm talking to you now where... <laughs> 
you know, I do that. I do my speaking right now, which is, you know, obviously about my life story. But, you know, as as we branch out, one of my big goals with the speaking is to teach entrepreneurship and micro entrepreneurship to to youth, to young people, to people who can't find jobs. Because I think that's something that's, unless you grow up around someone who started a business, it's very hard to find the confidence to start a business. Mm-hmm. And particularly when you look at a law mowing business, it's real easy to start up. There's not much startup capital and it's a need that's always there. And if you get a, if you get a young kid who's looking for an income and you teach him, hey, grab a lawnmower, you know, this is market analysis. You know, you're going to go knock on every door today around your neighborhood and figure out what someone's willing to pay, what products they want. And you're going to develop a product out of that. And hey, this is customer relations. This is how you keep customer, customer retention. They're going to learn so much more from that. And they're going to then be able to enter the job market at a higher level. And that's kind of been a little project of mine over the last couple of months is figuring out the best way to do that, whether it's through my talking or establishing a YouTube channel, et cetera. And um, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's kind of my, my little story up to now. And it seems like the theme is, you know, people telling you you can't do something and you proving them wrong. Do you think there's a power in that and being under underrated or undervalued? Well, it, t- it took me a long time to figure it out. Is that any time I gave in to what people thought of me and being underrated, I really gave up a lot of control I had in my life. That when I start going, you know what, I'm going to do the opposite of what you say I can do, I take control. And to me, that's when we feel overwhelmed is when we lose that control. So in terms of me looking for a job, me taking control is doing that MBA. It's saying, here's a situation that I feel overwhelmed with, but I can control this, this, and this. And that's going to put me on a pathway forward to then knock down the other points. And for me, that was that big learning curve of not giving up control to others, but taking it myself in my own life. You know, a lot of the times, particularly with my young daughter who is going through cancer, you feel out of control. But the control we, we learned to have is that we can't control her health, but we can control how we interact with her every day, the time we spend with her, you know, not being on our phones because we never know how long this is going to last. But we can control that. We can control her daily interaction. And that then gives us more empowerment in our lives. And that's what I feel, I feel has really helped with navigating life, which comes at you in all different angles. <laughs> and before we wrap things up, do you want to tell people where they can find you, how they can support what you got going on? Yeah. So, you know, right now we just released my speaking website, zachbryers.com. Z-A-C-K-B-R-Y-E-R-S.com. And, you know, I'm active on LinkedIn. You know, I've been told, you know, you get on Facebook, get on all the social media and stuff. And I'm trying to get on that. But at the moment, they're the two areas. And, you know, hopefully we'll grow my YouTube channel, Hustle Vids, and, you know, speak to, you know, anyone who's looking for that little insight into business and entrepreneurship and help grow the entrepreneurship community. Well, Zach, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story. I really appreciate it. That's all good. Thanks for having me. Obviously, amazing stuff you've been through, man. I appreciate it. (laughs) Cheers for that. If this conversation added any value to your life or taught you something new or helped you think about things a little bit differently, you don't have to subscribe. You don't have to leave a review. All I ask is that you just tell one friend. We don't care about the numbers. We don't care about the stats and all that stuff. What we do care about is impacting lives. And by telling someone about the show, you're helping us do that. So thanks for tuning in. And remember, Hustle and Motivate is brought to you by JokerMag.com, the home of the underdog.